Hey YouTube, just a quick video. I'm going to be talking about three things. The Fourier and inverse Fourier transformations, the D Dirac delta function, and the Gaussian integral. Let's get this one out of the way first. What on earth does this integral actually equal? Well, I can tell you what the square of it equals. It just becomes this double integral. And we can perform a change in coordinates. If we do that, to let x and y range from negative infinity to positive infinity, we have to let theta range from negative pi to positive pi, and r go from 0 to infinity. If we do that, the integration over theta is trivial. It just gives a factor of 2 pi. And the integration over r is also trivial, because this is the antiderivative. It gives a factor of 1 half. And so, the square of this integral, the square of it, is equal to pi. And there you have it. The integral itself is equal to the square root of pi. Okay, now notice how we can perform a change of variables such that dx is equal to k dt. So we can re-express this integral like so. And if we wanted to, we could divide both sides by the square root of pi to get an integral from negative infinity to positive infinity that happens to equal 1. That's important because I'm going to be talking about the delta function next. Suppose we have a non-negative function. I'm going to call it delta. And we know the upper and lower bound of this function, g, at all places where delta is not 0. Well, g times delta must be somewhere between the upper and lower bound times delta um, at all places where both conditions are satisfied. And so, if we want, we can plonk an integration symbol and integrate over any domain where these two conditions are satisfied. Well, let's suppose we take delta to be this function here for a chosen value of k. Well, we said just a moment ago that it doesn't matter what choice of k we make, this integral from negative infinity to positive infinity will equal 1. OK. So, this is just 1. And this is just 1. Next, let's suppose we take the limit as k grows without bound. What will this function look like? Well, delta of 0 is going to grow up and up without bound, because that's just k on root pi. But for any other value of t, this limit will actually tend towards 0. And you can check that using the rule of l'hôpital which states that the derivative of this indeterminate form is just equal to the derivative of the top divided by the derivative of the bottom, and you still take the limit. So the, the denominator grows much quicker than the numerator. So what does it look like? As k gets bigger and bigger, this becomes closer and closer to an infinite spike at t equals 0. For all other choices of t, the function gets infinitesimally small. OK. And the area underneath it is preserved. It is always equal to 1. So if a and b are the maximum and minimum values of g at all points where delta is not 0, well, there is only one place where delta is not 0, and that's t equals 0. So that's going to be g of 0. And this is also going to be g of 0. So there is only one thing that this integral could possibly be if we define delta as I've done on the other side of the board. There is only one thing that it could possibly be, and that's g of 0. <coughs> there you have it, the delta function. So the delta function doesn't really have any meaning by itself because this limit doesn't exist. But if it's put underneath an integration over t, 
then it does have meaning, and its meaning is to get rid of the integration symbol and set t equals to Can zero. Alright, now I'm going to use this definition of the delta function to prove the Fourier theorem, which states that if you take a function f and you perform the Fourier transform as I've defined it up here, then you can recover the original function f by performing the inverse Fourier transform as I've defined it here. Do you or do you not? Let's check. Alright, so do you or do you not recover f if you perform the Fourier transformation and then multiply by e, i, omega, t and integrate over omega to get to perform the inverse Fourier transformation and divide by 1 on 2 pi. Well, this integral can be combined into a double integral uh, and I can combine these two ex exponential t uh, factors together and I can switch the order of integration as long as omega and s both still range from negative to positive infinity. Now here's the trick. I'm going to put in this fudge factor of e to the negative omega squared on 4k, but I'm going to take the limit as k tends towards infinity. So as k grows, close, grows larger and larger without bound, uh, the fudge factor becomes closer and closer to unity and it shouldn't affect my final answer. Why on earth would I want to do something like that? This is why. Because if I perform completion of the square on this exponential term, this is what I get. Let's check. If I have two terms and I square it, I get the square of this term with the minus sign, and I get the square of this term, which I'm compensating for, keeping in mind that i squared is equal to negative 1. And I also get a cross term, which is 2 times this times this. So 2 times this times this, and here we have it. So I can take this and use that as, as the exponential factor. And I can split it up into two pieces, e to the power of this piece and e to the power of this piece. And I'm ready to do my integration over omega. Because there is only one term one factor that depends on omega, and this one is it. So the integration over omega really is just the Gaussian integral, which I introduced first up. Except instead of e to the negative t squared, I've got e to the negative omega on 2k minus ik t minus s squared. So if I just perform a change of a variable, then instead of root pi, I get 2k times root pi. The other factors, the f of s and the e to the negative t minus s squared k squared, they don't depend on omega, so they can be moved out of the integration symbol. And this is what I've got. The 2 here cancels with this 2. And the root pi here partially cancels with the pi on in the denominator here. Well, hang on a second. This looks very familiar the limit as k tends towards infinity of k times e to the negative t minus s squared k squared divided by root pi. And indeed it is. So, this here is nothing more than the delta function of t minus s multiplied to this function f of s integrated from negative infinity to positive infinity over s. And according to the property of the delta function, which I proved just a moment ago, this integral is equal to f of t. So there you have it, the Fourier theorem.